good old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and bought me With his redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew him And all my love is to him He plunged me to victory Beneath the cleansing flood I heard about a mansion He has built for me in glory And I heard about the streets of gold Beyond the crystal sea About the angels singing And the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Think of someone you know who is a person of good character. Now lock his or her image in your mind and take a moment to reflect on the things that this person says and does, the personal characteristics that make him or her a role model for you. Well, what comes to mind? What do you see? Chances are that high on the list of your role model's qualities is commitment. The unwavering dedication to being a good family member and a friend, to doing his or her best at work and away from the job, a commitment to doing what's right, what is noble, and what is decent. Committed people like your role model just seem to have their heads and their hearts in the right place. They keep their priorities straight. They stay focused on what's important. And they seem to know inherently that what they believe must drive how they behave. And how they behave ultimately determines the character that they possess, the reputation that they enjoy, and of course the legacy that they will one day leave. Commitment is what transforms a promise into reality. It is the words that speak boldly of your intentions and the actions which speak louder than words. This is a quote from Abraham Lincoln and what he had to say about commitment. It is making the time when there is none, coming through time after time, year after year. Commitment is the stuff character is made of, the power to change the face of things. It is the daily triumph of integrity over skepticism. The world-renowned pianist Van Cliburn, after one of his magnificent concerts, was approached by an admirer who had been in the audience, and the emotional fan grasped uh, Clyburn's hand and said, I would give my life to play the piano like that. And Clyburn replied, I did. 
So how are you doing on your commitment to the Lord and to his church? We want to look at some passage or a passage that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians regarding our liberty in Christ and also our commitment to the Lord and the character traits that make and can make us a blessing to others. The passage is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, beginning, and we'll read down through the 12th chapter in verse 1. And uh, this translation is from the New Living Translation. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I am saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eat, eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the demon's table too. What, what, do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think we are stronger than he is? You say, I'm, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it. Out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to the Jews or to Gentiles or to the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that they may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. One thing we would should mention is in this context where he's talking about the meat offered to idols, we have to go back and remember the practices of the time. The meat that had been offered in an idol's temple might find, some of it might find its way into the marketplace and be sold there and taken home by someone and so when he says, if you're invited by an unbeliever uh, to have dinner with them, go with them and eat and don't ask any questions about what you're eating uh, for conscience sake. But he said, if someone does tell you well, this meat came from an idol's temple, then don't eat it. Uh, not necessarily for your own conscience sake, but the, for the conscience of the person that asked you that question. And of course, he points out that we know that an idol is not anything. It's not a real God, but in the heart and the mind of the worshiper, the one who worships the idol, 
it is a, a matter of their conscience. And so Paul said he didn't want to violate anyone's conscience. Uh, I want to look at just a few of the verses from this reading. And first one we want to look at is verse 21. He said, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. When I think about that, I think, you know, we don't go out and get drunk on Saturday night and then maybe stumble into church on Sunday morning. That's what he's saying. We can't live in both worlds. As Elijah challenged the people of Israel in 1 Kings 18 and verse 21, Elijah came to all the people and he said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. And so they were noncommittal, even at that point. You know, we must make a commitment to the Lord. We cannot ride the fence or halt between two opinions. And until the mighty demonstration that day there on Mount Carmel, when Elijah confronted the 400 prophets of Baal, the people finally said they would serve the Lord after they had seen the demonstration. But at first, they were still noncommittal. But Elijah was saying, you have to choose, make a choice. You cannot serve both. It's the same charge that Joshua gave the people in his day as recorded in Joshua 24, verses 14 through 18. Joshua said, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua said, me and my family, we've made our mind up. We've made a commitment. We'll serve the Lord. We cannot halt between two opinions. And you go on and read and you'll find that all of the people of Joshua's generation served the Lord while they were living, and the next generation after him served the Lord. And probably a lot of that was due to his commitment that also caused others to be committed. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know, the Apostle Paul said we are to be in the world, but not of the world. The Apostle John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we have to choose. We have to make a commitment to serve the Lord. And uh, this is one of the things that Paul is pointing out to the people in this passage. In verse 24, Paul said, Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Paul admonished the Philippians in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So he 
shows us that Jesus is our prime example here. He left heaven. He was, he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And he said he came and made himself a bond servant. You know, the servant of someone else who does someone else's bidding. And so it says, let this mind be in you. What mind is that? It's the mind that has a concern for others. And what does it mean anyway to put others before yourself? Selfless is the opposite of selfish. If you are selfless, you think less about yourself and more about others. You're generous and you're kind. Being selfless is similar to being altruistic. Another word uh, for this word altruistic is another word for giving to others without looking for your own personal gain. So what Paul is saying here, he's not saying that we shouldn't care anything about ourselves, but he is saying, and in this context where he'd been talking about the eating of meats, he shouldn't put his own appetite and his own personal desires before the spiritual welfare of the others that are around him whose consciences might be offended. And, and so he is saying that we ought to think about others. Some people might say, well, you know, acting like that and just putting others before yourself, that's a sign of weakness. Is it really? Is putting others before us or sacrificing our desires to please someone else uh, a sign of weakness? Was it a sign of weakness in Christ? He left heaven. <laughs> he put his interest aside even while he was here. He put his own personal interest aside in order to serve others. Was he weak? I think not. It's not a sign of weakness. In fact, it is actually a sign of self-adequacy, of strength of mind and a willingness to make relationships work and a willingness to do what is in the best interest of others. And so putting others' needs before our own needs is to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in uh, verse 31, Paul said, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Of course, giving God glory means honoring Him and praising Him for who He is. It means magnifying His name and reflecting on His loving character through our thoughts and through our words and through our actions. And of course, the primary way in which we honor God is through obeying Him. This was the hallmark of Jesus's life here upon this earth. He, say, uh, he said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So we're following in the example of Jesus when uh, we do things for the glory of God and when we honor him by obeying him. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And of course, when he says do all in the name of the Lord, he means do all by the authority of the Lord. In other words, in accordance with God's will. You know, Jesus taught his disciples to pray when they asked him to teach them to pray in what we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer. A part of that prayer was, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are to be the servants of the Lord at his bidding, doing what is best for others. 
Then in verse 33, Paul said, I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. Now, Paul does not mean here that we should give in to pressures around us. When he says, I try to please everyone, he wasn't saying that he gives in to pressures to follow in the footsteps of others. He was talking again, and we'll look, if we'll look at the context, he's talking about putting the needs and the good of others before his own uh, wants or desires. And so he's not teaching us to give in to peer pressure or to give in to pressure that others put on us, maybe even to do things that are wrong. And he is not telling us to conform to the world. You know, a lot of people in the world puts pressure on us to conform, to do what the world says is right. But Paul's not teaching this. Rather, Paul is telling us to be different from the world because to put the good and the needs of others before our own needs is certainly different from what most of the world does. We are to put others ahead of ourselves and to do what is in their best interest. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus definitely teaches here that there are more going into the broad gate and down the broad way than through the narrow gate and on the narrow way. And of course, that broad way is the way of just going along with the crowd. It's the way of giving in to the pressures that the world brings to bear upon us to act like the world, to be like the world. But Jesus says, that may be the easy way, but it's not the best way. Paul admonishes us in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To be conformed to the world means to adopt the values, the behaviors, the thinking or the attitudes of the world. And uh, to not be conformed to the world means avoiding adopting the values, behaviors, the attitudes that are commonly associated with the prevailing societal norms and cultural expectations. And there are so many pressures on us today, many of them that are in direct, direct contradiction to God's word, to give in and to be like the world says we ought to be, to take their values about things rather than God's values. We're not to do that. We're not to be conformed to the world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then in the 11th chapter in verse 1, and some uh, scholars believe that this verse should have been in the last verse in chapter 11. But uh, anyway, he said, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Well, what does it mean to imitate Christ? When we imitate Christ, we not only do what he did, such as praying, but we also do it for the same reason. Jesus prayed because he loved his Father and those he prayed for. And we can look at his prayer in John 17 that uh, expresses this idea. We can make the mistake of trying to mimic Christ in actions, but without his motives and his character. And so it means to imitate Christ means to do the things that Christ did and for the same reason 
that he did those things because we're looking out for the good of others. Someone may ask, well, how can we imitate Christ? Well, we do that by respecting and obeying those in authority. And this is taught in various passages, for instance, in John 19, 10 and 11. We can do so by feeding the hungry, as we read in John 6, 1 through 15. We can do so by helping the six, as we read in Matthew 8, 1 through 3. By sharing in people's joys and in their pain as we read in John 2, 1 through 11, and Romans 12, 15. We can imitate Christ by rebuking the prideful and exhorting the humble, as we read in Luke 7, 36 through 50, or by standing up for God and standing against those who would pervert God's word, as we read in Matthew 15, 3 through 9. We imitate Christ by not allowing prejudice to make us turn aside from God's will. Again, Matthew 15, 21 through 28. We imitate Christ by having a habit of assembling for worship, as we read in Luke 4 and verse 16, where as was his customer habit, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath to worship. We imitate him by bringing ourselves into subjection to do God's will when it is easy and even more so when it is more difficult as we read in John 8, 29. We imitate him by seeking the lost, as we read in Luke 19, 10, where at the house of Zacchaeus, Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek that which was lost. We imitate Christ by loving our brethren, by loving our neighbor, as Christ himself taught in John 13, 34, and 35. And in Matthew 22, 39. And of course, the number one way that we can be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is by loving God first and foremost in both words and in action. You know, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our strength, with our, all our soul and all our might, and to love our neighbor as ourself. For as Jesus taught on these two commands, hang all the law and the prophets, all of the other relationships and the, the rules that affect those relationships hang on these two uh, commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. And of course, that speaks you know, to the motive of our actions, why we do the things that we do. So we need to be committed to the Lord, to his word. And when we are, it will instill in us that character that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're so thankful to you for the example that our Lord Jesus set in leaving heaven to come to this earth, to take him upon himself the form of the flesh and to suffer as we do in the flesh, both physically and mentally and emotionally, all of the things that we experience here upon the earth. And we know he did that so that he could be the perfect high priest to make intercession for us. And we're so thankful for that. And in times, Father, when we are troubled and we seek your help and your guidance, we're thankful that Jesus knows and understands our needs and that he can help us. And so help us, Father, to turn to you in those times when we are distraught or when we're troubled, when we may feel that we uh, are undone or we don't know what we can do. Help us to rely upon your strength in those moments and to trust in your word. We pray, Father, that you will help us to have the mind of Christ, that we will be committed to you and to your word of truth and to all the principles that it teaches us, that we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and that we will love our neighbor as ourself and that we will do so in the way that we act and the way that we treat one another. We thank you, Father, for Jesus.
for our perfect example. And we pray that you would help us to imitate him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. My friend, I pray that all is well with you and yours. And I pray that daily you are going about doing good and living out the principles of God's word that a committed Christian will do. Until we see you again, may God bless and keep you. There's a river somewhere that's called Jordan And they say that it's deep and it's wide And they say that the king and the beggar On that shore will stand side by side crossing of the Jordan. Why should I be afraid? There'll be someone there who loves me to guide me. Cross the river to Cross the river